produced. So we want to talk for a second about what it means to be sprayable. So Gen really highlighted this yesterday in, in part of his talk because at, at the end of all of this, what we care about is that this powder can be designed to get onto that substrate and, and, and finish to the, the part that we want. So when we think about sprayable um, or sprayability, we can actually go back to the mill standard, the DTL 32495A that, that ARL has drafted, and we're defining sprayability in here, right? And if you've read through the document, it's a lot of fun, and by fun, I mean it's painful, but hey, that's, that's what specs and standards are, are, are there for, is to kind of guide us and craft us along the way. But really important here is, is it actually highlights in a couple of sections, you know, what is, what is sprayability? And, and again, we're gonna talk about it, it's not it's not the powder. The powder itself may be sprayable, but when we're defining sprayability, it's all about the deposit. So the first thing you do is you, you look at the deposit. You make sure that there's no flakes. You make sure that there's no big uh, holes or, or dinghies on the top of the, the material. And then you go and you section it, right? You cross section, you look at the microstructure, you look for porosity, you look for some sort of contaminant. And at the end of it, you say, okay, great, I had a sprayable material because it's fully dense, uh, all the powders were consolidated, there's no foreign contaminants, okay, that's, that's sprayable. But, but again, it was not just the powder, it was the powder and the process and combination that defined sprayability. So if we, if we kind of go backwards in this chain, right, we think about, okay, if, if the part is what we really care about uh, and the process is kind of preceding the part, we really need the process to be consistent and controlled, uh, compatible with the materials that we're using, right? Not all materials work in all systems at the same settings, configurations. You might get wear of your nozzles. You might get fouling. You might just not have enough temperature and pressure in your process to be able to deposit those materials. But then if you chase that, you know, uh, chain one step up then to the powder, you need to make sure that that powder is, is feedable. And you know, we've talked a lot about how powder feeds in the past. And sometimes we're really worried about the fines that are in the powder. Sometimes we're really worried about the morphology of the powder. But at the end of the day, if you can feed it, that's usually all you need, right? So sometimes fines are actually good in your powder. It's not always a bad thing. And sometimes uh, an angular powder might be better than a spherical powder because it's got different microstructural characteristics or because it's got different chemistry characteristics or because, you know what, angular powders may actually have some unique deformation characteristics that are, are better for you than spherical powders. So there's some value there in thinking about how they feed as opposed to just whether or not you have all the fines removed. Um, in general, we want them to be free of moisture, right? That's, that's one of the things that we've determined in a lot of the different materials can really uh, impact the sprayability, and we think about sprayability in terms of mechanical properties, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the last one here is, uh, I'll, I'll call it formable, right? So it, sometimes we say, you know, you need a ductile phase, or you need a soft phase in cold spray, but really you need something that's gonna be formable. So you need some uh, aspect in there that at the size scale, at the conditions that you're operating at, it, it, it can form or it can deform. And that can be true of everything from ceramics to metals to polymers. Uh, and so with that in mind, you have a wide window of materials that you can play with to create that, that formability. So we've done this for a bunch of different materials in collaboration with a, a lot of different partners. Um, there were questions yesterday about you know, where you can get some of the materials, whether it's the WIP products or some of the, the SAM aluminums. So those are all available um, through, through, through our organization. Um, you can find it at powdersondemand.com. And there's a bunch of others that are in the pipeline, right? So we've got everything from silver materials to uh, refractory materials, um, new versions of WIP products that are able to be nitrogen sprayable, a whole line of aluminum that are designed to be nitrogen sprayable. And all of it comes back to using uh, kind of the, the same fundamentals that we're talking about here to uh, get ourselves to the point where we have a sprayable material. And everything that we, that we work on in, from start to finish, it's, it's making sure that that material will give you that end result that you're looking for. So if we think about the qualification chain then of the cold spray powder process, right? There's all these really great attributes of the material that we care about from a, a materials perspective, but at the end of it, um, you need a supply chain that's accountable, transparent, and, and reliable. And so the, the mill standard uh, does a great job of holding 
uh, a lot of different materials to that. There's a lot of different attributes that are monitored and tracked in the MIL standard. Um, but that's, that's only one piece of uh, kind of this equation. There's another piece that's around the safety, right? So making sure that your materials are suitable for uh, not just the cold spray process, but also cold spray handling, how you package those materials, um, whether or not they're flammable. Um, so that's a huge part of what we do in conjunction with um, some of our partners at, at ARL and Jensen Hughes, um, developing kind of recommendations for how you can use these materials in an actual uh, repair station, whether that's a depot, shipyard, or a commercial provider, uh, making sure that you have as much understanding as possible of, of how to handle those materials so that you can use them to, to solve problems, right? That's what we're here for at the end of the day is to make sure that those materials are suitable for solving the problems that you have. And all too often we're hearing about, you know, one final safety step as being the blocker to prevent people from actually using materials and getting the job done. Um, so working with uh, folks like VRC, uh, ARL, the shipyards, the, the depots to try and draft some of these documents is really important. So one of the things that I'd encourage everybody is if you find uh, yourself in a situation where you're, you're struggling to get past that last safety hurdle, uh, reach out to the kind of collective cold spray community, reach out to the cold spray team because there's more and more information going on there about how to set up uh, and how to get through some of those initial safety barriers. So happy to say the, the, the SAM products and the WIP products after extensive testing are all non-flammable, uh, they're, they're non-explosive, so we actually are able to send these out to you um, with, with reduced safety restrictions, uh, reduced, reduced hazard restrictions, sorry, uh, because of the testing that's gone into these and the engineering that's gone into the materials to, to fit into these categories. So I wanna talk for a second about what this kind of cycle of going through qualification means with the mill standard, um, because I think it's important to understand what that means for the materials and the material performance. So when you start, you, you have powders from a variety of different sources, right? We, we work with a lot of different materials, uh, everything again from your, your low temperature, low melting materials, to polymers, to refractory materials, hard phases, everything in between. So we work with a lot of different providers to prepare the right materials for or cold sprayability, right? And then we go through and measure all the different attributes of the powder, um, and all of that's done at actually a NADCAP or an ISO certified test house. Then you go through and you spray the parts, uh, or you spray the powder to, to create whatever coupon you need for your, your proper testing per the mill standard. Um, and all that's gotta be recorded and tracked, right? It's gotta be appropriate per what we'll call the, the Cognizant Engineering Authority here. Um, you've got to go through, review the cross-sections of the materials, make sure it's porosity-free, uh, typically measure some sort of mechanical property. Um, a lot of times that's going to be tensils, it may be uh, hardness, it might just be that you're looking at the, the structure to make sure that it's defect-free. Then you go through, determine all your shelf life requirements, packaging, all of that fun stuff, technical data sheets, safety data sheets. Finally, you get through all of that. and it goes through review, right? So this is a months long, or in some cases, years long process to make sure that the materials that are getting out there to the community are the right materials that are compatible, viable, and can be effective in, in the cold spray process. So there's actually three of these, uh, three of our SAM aluminums. We've got a whole pipeline coming through uh, the, the qualification process right now. Um, but what this is at the end of the day is, is we joked about it yesterday, but it's, it's that easy button, right? Because these have gone through all the testing that you need to know that, hey, this is gonna work in a cold spray process. And that's really what we're here for, right? We're, we're here to facilitate uh, being able to cold spray a variety of different materials uh, and, and focus on the part, right? Focus on getting to the problem that we're solving and not spending so much time on the materials, not spending so much time on the development, but again, focus on solving that problem. So I wanna talk about kind of how we go through our material design to think about um, different techniques, different screening capabilities that we've developed that allow us to uh, more and more rapidly develop new materials, new solutions. Um, so the first one that you, you see up here is, we call it our, our impact tester. So this is a little, a little pin uh, that we, we drop it at very high speeds. Actually, now it's pressurized. Um, and we compact it into a little disc, right? This is kind of like cold spray light, if you will. And all this is is simulating a lot of the same uh, high-speed strain mechanisms that you might see in cold spray. It's by no means on the same order of magnitude, but it gets you close, and it's a quick screening study that costs, you know, five cents instead of a couple thousand dollars. So when we do this, we're using it for a variety of different reasons. In this scenario that I'm showing up here, um, we're looking at the uh, development of a different bond coat. Um, so we're looking for a new bond coat for a uh, 4340 steel, and we said, all right, you know, 
maybe we can do some quick screenings to see what other materials we can incorporate here to make this as, as sprayable as possible. So quickly we ran through uh, actually a cryo-treated material, a couple of different uh, alumina type materials. We compared it to the, the base material. Um, but the one that you can see across the top here that was consistent across the whole kind of compositional range is a chrome carbide. So we said, all right, this is perfect. This is the right material for uh, this type of bond coat because we're getting a consistent deposition. We're not changing over the course of uh, kind of that, that change in composition. So we can lock in maybe like that 50% uh, mark for a, a bond coat material here. And so you can see uh, actually triple lug shears before and after the bond coat, we're getting what, four and a half, five X increase in triple lug shear uh, adhesion strength based on just that incorporation of the bond coat. And we know bond coats are important, right? But sometimes developing a bond coat can take a long time or you go back to uh, kind of the same bond coat solution. But you don't always have to. There's ways to do quick evaluations to determine maybe the right bond coat for you without a whole lot of testing. Thinking about the same, uh, the same test mechanism, the same screening mechanism in a, in a different manner, we can actually take it and, and compact just straight metals, right? It doesn't have to be a bond coat, doesn't have to be a blend of materials. Um, so we've got two different chromes that we were looking at. One's a, a dried chrome and one's just kind of an as-received chromium powder. And same kind of story, we said, all right, you know, you can take a quick comparison between the two different materials and spray those and you can compare the performance. So the, the top one here is the unprocessed, the bottom one is the dried, and it's just a thin, quick demonstration, but it shows that very quickly we were able to uh, validate that the dried material was going to behave better than the unprocessed material. Not necessarily a surprise, but again, gives you the, the capability to quickly screen and evaluate whether or not a material is gonna be uh, more or less suitable for cold spray. So another uh, aspect of this that's really important is not just the screening, but also the quality assurance, right? So we do a lot of different treatments to materials, whether it's uh, some sort of mechanical procedure, it's a thermal procedure. Um, and so we need to make sure that the materials that are coming out of our processes are uh, appropriate, right, that, that they meet all of the standards and specifications that we talked about. So we've got a technique that's uh, developed actually based on um, some designs and literature uh, to measure resistivity of a powder compact, right? So we take the, the powder, we put it into a little, uh, a little uh, stand, we compress it down, we measure resistance across the powder, and we're able to tease out of that um, resistance of the powder compact. We do it over a pressure range, and we can get these nice little curves. So what we're looking at here is really just microstructural differences in materials. There might be some slight changes in uh, surface chemistry, uh, but at the end of it, the, com the, the compositions, as far as you're gonna measure, are all the same. The size distributions are all the same. Uh, but what you can see over the pressure curves is whether you're uh, an untreated or an air-treated material uh, or you're a processed material that's been processed for, let's say, shorter times and temperatures, all the way down to something that's been over-processed, so something that has gone in the furnace for too long um, or uh, ramped up too quickly. Um, you can see that there's distinct patterns to all of these, and we've got a bunch of data on the back end that we can do to compare where new powders fit into this, this, this matrix. So we're able to, to determine whether or not a material is suitably processed. Again, this is part of the quality assurance that we made sure that our tests, our procedures, match with what's needed in cold spray, right? Most of the powder bed processes, the, the laser DED processes, they're not too worried about uh, small amounts of surface contaminants. They're not too worried about what the microstructure looks like because you're melting the material, right? You're giving that that kind of normalization step and we don't have that in cold spray. So quickly, I'll kind of jump through a, a couple of uh, interesting case studies that, that um, were done with um, some of our partners at, at WPI. Um, so this is comparing a lot of different uh, sizing techniques, laser diffraction versus static image analysis versus a whole bunch of others. And the, the bottom line out of this is you want to be really, really careful when you're selecting a sizing technique and you want to be very, very consistent when you're selecting a sizing technique. We're not going to necessarily recommend one versus another, uh, but at the end of it, you just need to make sure that it's consistent and you need to know that there's a lot of variability between vendors, even vendors that are ISO certified. So if you're measuring size uh, from a, a powder provider and you're measuring it again, at, um, let's say, a, a test house, those results may not compare. Uh, so you just have to have uh, that, that kind of foreknowledge that there's, there's some variability even in uh, you know, an off-the-shelf uh, 
sizing piece of equipment from vendor to vendor based on how they've selected their parameters. We like to use uh, a, an image analysis technique uh, because in particular, as you can kind of see across the bottom here, um, we care a lot about those finds. Again, sometimes you want them in there, sometimes you don't want them in there, but we like to know the, the number count of material uh, that's actually below a certain size threshold. This is really important for understanding how that material is going to behave in the cold spray process. We've done this for a lot of different powders, a lot of different samples. Um, so we've got a, a really nice backlog of data that we're actually now starting to explore more and more uh, machine learning quality control techniques. So that's a topic for a totally different day, um, but a lot of fun things you can do when you start to collect this many data points on your materials. So wrapping things up here. We've got a variety of different cold sprayable materials. Again, they meet that definition of sprayability. They've been demonstrated over and over again. They're going through that qualification process. It covers everything from structural materials uh, to wear resistant materials and some functional materials. So uh, if there's something on this list that you don't see, reach out and we're happy to help co-develop that with you. Um, just some quick highlights, 6061, uh, again, that's on the, the qualified products uh, database. You can, you can uh, see this in the slides or, or go out to our booth. Um, a bunch of questions yesterday about the WIPW1. Um, that, is, that is available, again, kind of 650 to 750 uh, Vickers hardness range. Um, it's a helium design material. There's a nitrogen sprayable version, but again, you gotta make sure that you have that compatibility between your materials. Um, and then there's a, a new product line that we're coming out with, uh, the Dark Series. Um, we try to keep this uh, below three to 5% incorporation of the hard phase, but again, it's designed to be nitrogen sprayable. So last thing I wanna highlight, um, and, and Vic mentioned it, but I just wanna reiterate it, just how important your handling and packaging of materials is. So uh, back in 2017, uh, this powder was first processed and, and packaged. We've held on to it year over year. You compare year one to today, we're, we're as good or, or better. I don't wanna say we're better because we're not actually seeing any kind of aging techniques here. This is just differences in how the, the uh, powder was sprayed. But the point is over four years, you get no, no detriment in your performance. Um, the material sprays as good as if it had just been processed. So again, handling those materials is really important. Please don't open a bag, leave it out there in your shop, uh, whether you're in Massachusetts or Texas, and then put it back in your feeder and say, hey guys, this didn't work. Yeah, it's not gonna work, right? Because it wasn't properly handled. So make sure you're, you're, you're properly handling all the materials um, regardless of where they are. Uh, and so just to kind of bring us to the next level, uh, talking about this idea of point of need, right? This is, this is six bottles of powder and a nice Pelican case ready to go. All the safety data is in there. Um, we know the shelf life of the materials. We know the stability. We know the safety. We know how to handle them. So now um, let's take these and put these where they're needed. Um, so we're, we have a line of packaging that's going with bottles so that you can go from processing uh, through packaging, through utilizing the powder uh, without it ever seeing atmosphere. So whether that's a blended material or it's a thermally processed material, um, we're working with folks like VRC to make sure that those powders can go right into that feeder and you never have to let that powder see atmosphere. And that's super critical to making sure that you have, again, that quality assurance that you need for long term into the future. So with that, I am done. Thank you all very much for the morning attention. I know hopefully coffee's kicking in and we're getting things geared up here, um, but I'm happy to take any questions with the, the couple minutes that I have if there are any here or online. And if there's not, that's okay. We can just keep the party rolling. Beautiful. I don't know, do we have, are we monitoring at the online? We are monitoring. Okay. Beautiful. Then that makes my job really, really easy. So um, next up, I would like to welcome Mr. Dan Stanley from Norfolk Naval Shipyard uh, to talk just a little bit more about how we are um, leveraging cold spray in, uh, you know, again, actual parts, right? Focusing on uh, using this technology to solve problems. Dan? Sure, I'm going the right direction. Next, next. Morning, everybody. Uh, Dan Stanley, Norfolk Naval Shipyard. I've heard I dress up a little bit since I'm probably the least educated person talking today. Uh, anyways, 
Going to go through, talk about Norfolk's uh, path to getting cold spray operational, a couple case studies, and kind of where we're going. So put a timeline together. So Jeff mentioned yesterday, uh, implementing technology in shipyards is very difficult. Uh, it's a process. So uh, 2016, I, I learned what cold spray was. Uh, PJ had done some repairs. I said, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, I have a lot of issues with material issues at the shipyard. Let's go start chasing this thing. A uh, couple years of failed capital projects. Um, but we got to 2019, Admiral Moore comes out and says, shipyards, go figure out cold spray, number one priority, let's make this happen. Uh, so we, you know, in August, went up to Penn State, coordinated an effort, repaired our first part, put it on the Wyoming. Uh, it's out chugging around right now, so it was a ductile cast iron uh, actuator body. Um, pretty straightforward repair, but again, learned a lot by doing it with Penn State. Um, we were in the same time renovating an existing thermal spray booth, um, which gave us a little bit of a leg up on some of the other shipyards, right? So we had some of the infrastructure already in place to do cold spray, so we just kind of rolled it in. Um, during that time frame, we'd made the decision to go with nitrogen generation, right? So we were doing the, doing the math and going, okay, uh, how many bottles are we going to be changing out each day? And you know, the government price of nitrogen is comparable to helium. So uh, there was also an advantage from a cost standpoint to do nitrogen generation for us. Uh, we got that system running up in November, uh, just before VRC came in in December to set up the equipment. Um, February timeframe of 2020, uh, we identified our first part, throw a little COVID in there. So we did our first repair in April, uh, completed that. And then since that point, we've done uh, eight different repair procedures, 11 different components, and we just got through our certification with NAVC uh, in May. So kind of a just quick ramp up uh, from where we started to now. So our booth is very unique. That's the best way I'm going to describe it. Kylie, uh, I, I think, was aghast. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a unique configuration. So we've got three rooms, two spray rooms and a control room integrated. Um, you know, kind of an awkward configuration to work with when you start putting equipment in place, but we found it to be very versatile in what it's allowing us to do. Uh, we're making some improvements to it. So got a large spray room. We'll go to the next slide here. So got two rooms. So we got a seven by 13 foot room. Um, it's got a spray hood in there, six axis robot. Um, variable speed spindle on it. The second room is 11 by 40. Uh, it's got a, you know, large lathe in there, um, a turntable that we bring in, et cetera. A roof comes off of it. This is stuff where we were doing radar masks, snorkel tubes, large items in the thermal spray world. So um, big rooms, um, 21,000 CFM dust collector tied to it. Um, so a lot of the infrastructure was already there. It was really just bringing in the powder or the power for the machines uh, and coming up with a layout for it. So this year we got funded to do a little bit shorter of a lathe in there. It's going to allow us to mount our two axis turntable to the floor, be serviced by the robot. Um, we're picking up a uh, cobot to basically service that larger lathe. Um, the larger lathe is going to allow us to do pre-machining, do the cold spray repair, do post-machining, only have to take the, the roof off once. Um, so some of these things that we said, hey, we'll try the existing equipment, did the repairs, said, hey, the existing equipment is not quite doing what we need to do, um, went for some improvements. So control room, uh, this is integrated in. Uh, we've incorporated a closed circuit TV system to allow you to monitor spraying as it's going on. Uh, really handy for uh, determining, you know, is the powder spraying right, is there any clogging issues, et cetera. Um, one of the challenges with shipyards is uh, having the ability to, you know, have any video related equipment inside the industrial area based off the type of work we do. Um, so the controllers are all in there. Uh, we even incorporated, a, we've got a FLIR camera to allow us to do thermal imaging of the parts as we're spraying it. Um, this was kind of a speculation we took last year off some funding to say, hey, let's at least have the ability to monitor the temperature of the parts uh, remotely. Uh, so nitrogen generation, so 
Uh, mind you, we're, we're, we're crawling along trying to figure out how to get cold spray into the shipyard. We said we're going to add the extra challenge of coming up with a nitrogen generation system. Um, so any of you guys that have looked into nitrogen generation, they can size the machine to whatever demand you want, right? Well, the problem is when you're setting up a process you've never done before and don't have any history on how much you know, usage is out there, you kind of got to take a shot for what you think you're going to use. Uh, so we were factoring, you know, a couple hours of spraying a day. Um, so we set this up to basically alternate back and forth. So you've got four generators on the bottom, uh, 64 bottles on the top, and we have the ability to bring in an additional 32 bottles for longer sprays. Um, you know, relatively inexpensive. Um, nice part about this one, it was easy to integrate in regards to power. You know, it runs off 120 volts, um, 90 PSI shop air. Um, you got a set of dryers there to dry it before it goes in the generators. Um, and the maintenance on it, you rebuild these booster pumps. They're on them. You know, you run them every 1,000, 1,200 hours. You'll go do a rebuild on them. You know, 500 bucks for a sealed kit and, you know, a day for the operator to put it back together. Uh, good to go. We, we basically bought an extra set and we got like a rotatable pool uh, to kind of just keep things moving. Uh, So helium, uh, we also speculated a little bit on this. So this is, I'll call it a hack helium recovery system. Is the best, a nice way to put it. Uh, so we bring bottles in and we've got a recovery pump, right? So you go spray you know, your helium, you get the bottles down to about 800 PSI. Uh, the government doesn't give you a credit for the remaining helium in those bottles. Uh, so what we do is we basically pump that helium out of uh, the bottles are getting ready to turn in, boost it back up to pressure. Um, basically, you're buying four packs, you get a, a pack free every time, is the way we kind of equated it. Um, fairly simple, makes it easy. Um, so far, it's proven out pretty well. Oop. Uh, so going through some of the cold spray repairs that we've done. Um, so as I had mentioned before, uh, we've repaired 11 components. A uh, variety of platforms, so uh, Ohio-class submarines, carriers, uh, our moored training ships down in Charleston, um, fast stack submarines, etc. cetera. Uh, cast iron, stainless steel, Cayman L, copper nickel, aluminum, bronze. Uh, we've done a variety, uh, both with nitrogen and helium, um, using a combination of Praxair powder, Solvus powders, uh, et cetera. So this is probably uh, a fine example of uh, not what to step into for a beginner's learning curve for cold spray, uh, but a good example nonetheless. So uh, this is a seawater disc off of 77, so CVN 77. And what had happened is the two pin locations, we had done some weld repairs. Uh, so they go through the effort, try to restore the bores on those pin areas, and warp the disc. Uh, discs are not available. Uh, the only way to get those discs would be to buy $80,000 worth of plate, try to weld it back together, uh, and remachine, right? So not ideal for, for the situation at hand, considering welding already got us to where we were at. Uh, so we went in and basically applied cold spray on the three surfaces there noted. Uh, you know, this thing's in the shape of the D, so you're having to try to get cold spray, in the bottom of a dovetail in the shape of a D and feather it out so you get a plane established so this thing could go back together. Um, so first repair we did, so getting the repair procedure done and the actual repair itself, uh, 33 working days, uh, you know, did it with nitrogen, so we had about 9,000 bucks to, to do this thing. Um, second one, we did one right behind it, 11 days, um, just showing the example of, you know, Part of the power of the UIPI is you go approve a repair procedure, you can go right back and go do it again. You don't have to go reinvent the wheel. Uh, that approval process is already there. So went through, came up with a mock-up. Um, so did a small mock-up of the actual cross-section, just trying to get a feel for spray pass. Uh, 17 different spray pass to get this to apply in all the areas that we needed to. Uh, we then went to a piece of aluminum just to get a feel for programming the robot. Um, part of that 
advantage of doing the aluminum was it told us that we did the order of the spray pass wrong on our smaller mock-up. So we went back, resprayed the mock-up with the new path orientation uh, to go there. Uh, I would like to say I have before and after pictures of this, but uh, one of my employees decided that his pictures of a pump impeller were more important than these, so uh, they were unfortunately deleted, but you'll have to do with these. Uh, this next one is a bronze uh, regulating valve, uh, so this goes on a submarine pump, uh, and it basically provides water to the mechanical seals of the pump. Um, so picture shows this plug sitting in there, but there's a, an O-ring groove there that is missing its inner wall. Uh, so we had a couple of these uh, pop up, uh, trying to figure out what to do. So uh, one of my employees approached me with this and says, hey, can we, can we cold spray this? And I'm like, and I'm looking at the part, you know, it's a $14,000 part. I'm like, go buy it, right? I already, I already figured we're going to have more effort required to, to go cold spray this than, uh, you know, just going to buy a new one. So hit the stock system, nothing's available. Vendors said, hey, it's gonna be a year before we resupply the stock system. Okay, well, let's go see what the fleet's got, right? So we'll see if we can can have it. This was an undocking item for Pasadena. I didn't wanna hold them up. There was a waiting list for this item. Uh, we were not on the top of that waiting list. So I said, okay, I guess we're gonna go try to do a cold spray repair. Uh, so we went in, uh, you know, 16,000 uh, bucks to do uh, the development for the coal spray repair, I would attribute most of that to helium uh, at this point. A um, thousand bucks to the actual repair. Um, so four weeks to do the first one, and then we turned around and, and did the second one. Same day, we did a little prep rate day before, so I gave it a day and a half to, to do the second repair. Uh, and again, this is one the Navy does, they consume about 10 of these a year. Uh, so it's an ideal situation for us to have the ability to do repeat repairs on this situation. Um, so, part of our learning experience has been trying to do uh, masking and plugging and trying to prevent cold spray from going where it doesn't need to go, but also being able to give you the features that you need. So we had to come up with some basically bridging. Uh, so we took an aluminum plug, uh, stuck it down into the bore of the valve body. Uh, we froze it just before and gave it a little bit of an interference fit once it thawed out. Uh, gave us a nice, nice tight fit, and then we basically just bridged over the top of it and built up our coal spray, and then we would machine the plug out afterwards. And we've done this uh, a few times with keyways and other, other components uh, to, to get the, the uh, desired profile. Put a little bit of a chamfer on it. Um, you know, this is a quarter inch union. That wall that was sticking up is very thin, so we wanted to have a little bit more of an anchor. So we put a little bit of a profile on the bottom of the union just to give it a little bit more stability. Uh, and we used a, a bronze chrome carbide blend for this, and then uh, we used helium. So uh, reached out to ARL and said, hey, we're trying to spray, you know, this powder. You know, ideally we'd like to do it with nitrogen. So they were doing it with nitrogen. They're like, hey, we're having a lot of issues with delamination, probably the lead content in the, the bronze. Recommend going with a helium. It'll keep it cooler um, and go. So that's what we ended up doing. Um, so... Part of the challenge with this particular component is it's all cast, right? You don't have any reference points to post machine off of, right? So we had to actually put this on an angle block, indicate off the angle block, do our pre-machining, take the angle block, bring it into the booth, spray the part, uh, and then bring it back in, in post machine and hopefully that everything lines up. Uh, you know, just again, castings are, are kind of notorious for having the ability to indicate off of to, to get back to where you need to be. And it's, it's a lesson we learned a little bit too from cold spray is you've got to be thinking post-machining before you cold spray because you can easily get rid of your reference points before that. So a um, couple of pictures in process. Uh, we've played around with masking a few times. This was a simple masking. We came up for this. Um, we were, uh, my production guys, I was kidding them a little bit about why didn't we just use a union nut to go over the top of this thing, but... Uh, they, they wanted a piece of plate, so that's, that's what we ended up going with. So this kind of shows you the as spray condition of the, the end of the valve. Uh, so we basically just filled up that whole surface and then we just came back in afterwards and post machined. Um, kept the part cool, 120 degrees, uh, right after we got done spraying it. So um, in regards to the, you know, that difference between helium and nitrogen, it's just really, again, based off of what you're doing. 
uh, trying to keep that in mind. And some post machine pictures of it. So uh, these are the two different parts that we did. Uh, again, we did them literally same day. Um, sprayed one, put it in the machine, uh, post machined it while the guys were setting up the spray for the second one um, and turned it around. Uh, this will be in service tomorrow. So boat's going in the water tomorrow. So uh, we should have a good feel for this one here in a few years, uh, how the repair is actually holding up. So kind of some uh, future state as to where Norfolk's going, right? So we're um, steadily doing repairs. Uh, we've got a crew of individuals assigned to the, the cold spray booth. And in addition, we're gearing up for a Raptor arrival at some point here in the near future. I got July on there, but we'll, we'll see when it shows up. Um, we've got a second thermal spray booth that we're actually gonna incorporate it into. Uh, let's do a little bit of fielding for it, and then we'll work on bringing it out onto the, the shop floor and uh, hopefully uh, pier side. Um, so part of that, I've been working on trying to figure out the, the containment for this. Um, you know, I'm a, a submarine-centric individual with my day job. So trying to look at the realities of components I want to spray are going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of interferences around it, right? So how do you make a containment that's flexible enough to go in situ or even in a machine shop, right? How do you uh, make the equipment versatile enough to set up in a machine shop to, to do a variety of things? So uh, doing a little bit of work on that. And then hopefully here in the near future, a Dragonfly will show up as well. A uh, couple of uh, components that we're kind of keeping our eye on. Um, got a bunch of shaft seal carrier rings from uh, 77 project that they donated to me uh, that's on our to-do list of things to get sprayed. Um, man engine guard valve for the 77, or for uh, CVN class is another item that we're taking a look at. Uh, been a lot of interest from the community. Um, and then hydraulic accumulator barrels, Tom Samey's been kind of pushing through some stuff with that. I'm hoping he uh, figures it out for me so that I can hopefully just use it. Uh, and then all ray, um, a lot of basically uh, desired for coatings aspect uh, for all ray components. Uh, and then uh, on the submarine side, I've got some VH valve uh, air induction exhaust stuff that uh, using cold spray versus an aluminum flame spray would be desirable. Questions? <laughs> Yeah, either one, go for it. Take it away. Mine are online. Keep your uh, tech valve disc repaired. Yep. Be sure it's working with conventional welding. Yep. Was there any working in the cold spray portion? Zero. No, we didn't have any issues with. Oh, sorry. So he was asking the question of uh, when we did the seawater disc repair, uh, did we have any warping post cold spray? Uh, versus what we experienced with the welding. The answer is no. So we um, did the cold spray repair on both of them. Uh, there's a rubber gasket that goes in that dovetail. Uh, but we, we went in, did the repair. Um, no leakage when we did the post check on it. So uh, we did not see any warpage. And the nice part about it is we came in and reestablished a plane on that. So that, that's the part where if there was anything that we saw for warpage, it would have been cleared up from the post machine. Uh, so we had some clamps on it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't it didn't pop up or anything like that. Yeah. Yep. So more question online. Looking at when you were setting up the the booth initially, especially the gas generation, did you look at different options of pricing up gas generation versus like kind of liquid gas storage tanks and kind of spray aviation? Yeah, so we, we actually did, right? So uh, I'll give credit to one of my production guys. Uh, my initial thought with, again, right, how much hurdles are involved with setting up cold spray, I really, I'm not going to say I wasn't as palatable to doing nitrogen generation as others. Um, but he kind of convinced me into it. And we did the numbers, right? So, um, you know, bottles, right? We did the, the bottle numbers and said, okay, you know, uh, using, you know, doing two to four hours of spray a day, um, you know, with nitrogen and then threw some helium numbers in there. 
Uh, we did those numbers. We also looked at bringing both nitro nitrogen in, right? Do I bring a tanker truck in and just have it sit outside? The, the qualm I had with the nitrogen tanker truck was the rental of the tanker. The nitrogen was cheap, but $4,500 a month for a tanker truck to sit out there was kind of kind of pricey. Uh, so that kind of made that undesirable. Um, we looked at the liquid nitrogen, you know, aspect of it, but again, it's a capital project, right? Do I got to go set up a tanker out there? And then you've still got to have a contract to have that thing filled every once in a while, right? So a lot of our decisions on, you know, equipment and things like that is really trying to make this self-sufficient. The generators, again, right, uh, they run on their own. We have the ability to maintain them. Conveniently, the vendor is literally down in North Carolina, so if we have any major issues, we can talk to them pretty fast. Um, but a lot of that self-sufficient sustainment part, right, um, a lot of this has been funded via innovation funds, right, that color of money. So when it transitions into the real world, right, hey, you're, you're a running process, it's trying to make it so that whoever's, you know, officially taking it over is understanding the full price implications of running it. Uh, so the generation part, yeah, I mean, we've, we've predicted between uh, nitrogen and helium that system alone is saving us 115,000 a year, just based off of what we would have to pay if we were doing it with just traditional bottles. So yeah, we did. We had to do the math to figure that one out. And I would recommend anybody doing a, a gas system like that, swage lock it, do not weld it. That's just my, my one recommendation. So these are all off of ships. So we've, we've got rotatable pro pool programs that we've been kind of keeping an eye on trying to, to pluck some of those components out of. But a lot of these, uh, or all of these were basically items that kind of came up and said, okay, well, they don't have an option or it's an opportunity for us. Let's go figure it out. Uh, you know, Tom Stamey called me up at the end of April this year and says, hey, I got two actuators I need some help with, right? And, you know, we're you know, holding things up. So yeah, a lot of our stuff has actually been one-off situations. And that's, that's a challenge that Norfolk's been looking at and the shipyards I'll look at is we're a job shop, right? I don't have uh, 50 F-18 Hornet boxes with the same wear condition going on, right? We, we get a lot of one-off situations where I've got to be able to fix that one part and put it back on the boat. So the setup is, a lot of it is, is the key. So we do, you know, follow the UIPI, right? So we go through, generate our QSP, sign the category classification to each of the repairs, go through bond buttons, triple lug shears, things like that. Um, do all that homework, go, hey, it's good. Um, go spray the actual part. We'll do a machine test on it, make sure nothing delaminates during the machining process, do a visual ring test, things like that. After that point, it's just our normal testing protocol for, you know, doing a hydro and a, an operational test uh, at that point. Any other questions? Sounds good. Thanks. All right. So next up, we're going to invite uh, Howie Morado from EWI to come up here. Um, EWI is is really uh, kicking off their uh, cold spray uh, center of excellence, and without without teeing him up too much, um, you know they're they're really really excited to get involved in the cold spray community and and kind of be a resource for everybody out here and their industrial membership as well. Um, so very excited to hear what you guys are going to be doing, and and uh, Howie, I'll I'll have you come on up here and just take it away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Howie Morado, and I also dressed up because, like Dan, I would challenge him for probably the least educated guy in the room. So I'm with you on that one, Dan. I uh, appreciate you setting me up well. Um, so Howie Morado, um, a few of you know me. I've been in the AM community for a while, but I've not really been in cold spray for a while. So a quick introduction about myself. Um, obviously, I'm not an engineer. <clears throat> I started uh, my professional career as an aircraft maintenance officer in the Marine Corps. Um, so I was around technology, but I didn't necessarily know technology that well at the time, um, and that was 27 years ago. 
So um, I'm actually still in the Marine Corps as a reservist. Uh, I'm a colonel now. Uh, I'm the deputy commander of the 4th Marine Logistics Group, which that means nothing to most of you, and that's fine. Um, but uh, the cool thing about uh, the Marine Corps is that we've really embraced additive manufacturing, and that's how I got into it. So back in 2015, um, I became the additive manufacturing lead for the Marine Corps. Uh, if you've been following at all what the Marine Corps has done with additive manufacturing, um, we, uh, we've grown immensely. It's still very tactical, still very polymer-focused. Um, but it's really advancing quickly and it's out there in the hands of the users out in the field. Um, so you've heard a lot about the field use. You saw what the Australians were doing. Um, the Marines have actually done a lot of work with the Australians on cold spray out in Darwin. Um, so again, um, kind of just got thrown into the mix back in 2015 and, and fell in love with it. And it's, it's kind of funny too, and I wish Vic were here to hear the story, because it's never fun to make fun of someone when they're not here. But you know, I also kind of, of wore black and white today because, you know, TVs were still black and white when Vic started cold spray. And he'll tell you that, right? He'll tell you that. But uh, I saw him for the first time back in 2015, and it was at Carter Rock. And I was like, what is this cold spray thing? And there's this really excitable guy up there, and it sounds awesome. I just don't quite understand it. So I talked to the guys over at NAVC at the time. A few of them might, might know Ben Buffard. It was Ben Buffard who kind of explained cold spray to me and what it meant to the Navy at the time right about the same time that, that Norfolk Naval Shipyard was getting into it in 2016. Um, and, uh, and I thought, this is a great technology, but I just don't know how I'm going to take it to the field. And that just shows you how far things have come in the last five years. And I was interested in parts. I'm like, well, you can't make parts. Well, you can make parts. So again, uh, pretty exciting stuff. Um, I, I, like I said, I led up till 2018. I worked for Philips Corporation for a little bit, um, distributing machines. And then I joined EWI in uh, the fall of 2020. So right in the middle of COVID. Um, and then I promptly got activated for seven months. So I haven't really been with EWI that long, but I do remember um, when I first joined, the CEO asked me, what is the, the CEO asked me, what is the, the main thing you want to do? What's your big vision? What do you, what do you want to bring that's different to EWI? Because we already do AM, we already do metal. Um, what is it? And I said, cold spray. I said, we absolutely have to do cold spray. Um, we don't have any of that capability. And, and I see this as, you know, the next in a way, the next big thing in, in AM. So that was where we started um, and had this idea of this EWI Cold Spray Center of Excellence. And, and here we are less than a year later, and we're getting ready to stand it up. And that's uh, what I'm here to talk to you about today. So, okay. so just briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about EWI. Probably not everyone here knows um, you know, who we are and what we do. Talk about our vision and capabilities that we want to bring in in support of uh, our vision of cold, the Cold Spray Center of Excellence, and then, you know, who we are at the end and, and, and who we want to work with, because ultimately, you know, you can have a lot of great technologies. We've seen Cold Spray, we've seen other additive technologies out there, but what's really driven this forward has been the people, right? So that's going to be the bottom line for us as well. So what is EWI, right? It says it right there, but it's a lot more than that. To me, and, and the thing that attracted me to EWI, is that we're an unbiased authority in our fields of expertise. And so you see those fields. Um, we're not you know, necessarily married to any technology within those fields um, and any OEM. Um, really, we want to advance those technologies with whomever may be the best partners, with who, whatever may be the te best technology within those fields. And we want to learn more, and we want to keep pushing. Um, you know, the cool thing about EWI is that it's a nonprofit. Um, what I, what, what's important to know about that is the good thing is we have a lot of money to do internal R&D. So um, there are ways to do projects sometimes with people that maybe you don't even need to spend your own money. Maybe we, you say, hey, you know, right now we can't do this, but we see this be, as being a big thing. We, we don't have funding coming in this fiscal year, right? And, and coming from DOD, I know how that is, right? Like we want it. We know we're going to probably get it in next year's budget but we want to know more before we go out and make the buy or move forward, there's opportunities at EWI to say, okay, well, we'll do an internal art research and development project on that ourselves, and we'll pay for it ourselves, and, and we'll produce the data, and we'll share it with you, right? And then, and then you can make a determination on what you want to do from there. So I think that's the biggest takeaway from being nonprofit is that we have that flexibility, which a lot of companies don't have, to do that internal R&D and get it funded and, and move forward and partner with you even before we technically partner with you. Potentially. So uh, another great advantage that I really like about working with EWI. Um, you know, it says there we help our clients overcome their most complex design and production challenges. I think I like to boil it down a little easier. Like for, for 
most of you in the crowd, well, for some of you in the crowd, you remember the old BASF commercials? We don't make the things you buy, we make them better, right? For the younger folks, sorry, you'll have to Google that one. Um, but, uh, you know, that's kind of what we do. You know, we're not, we're not necessarily making the technology or making the machine. What we're trying to do is make it better and make it better in a practical way that can be applied by you all, by you all in the community, whether in the fence community, the commercial community, whomever. Um, we really focus on the TRL1, MRL1 to 7 range, um, and then we really want to transition that out. Uh, again, the great thing about us is we're not, we're not out there trying to uh, make our own systems and then sell them. We're trying to help you do that. Or we're trying to help you use the systems you have that you bought better to do new things. So, and a big part of what we do is developing IP. Now, a lot of IP we developed, we'll share, right? Especially that which we make through IRDs or develop through IRDs. Um, but when we work with a lot of our clients, some we can't even see who our clients are, um, we are also very good at keeping that IP private as well. So, but really it boils down to um, we're an IP company in a lot of ways that just happens to work with a lot of different technology. So um, the one thing you don't see on there in the expertise and range of technologies is recently added, um, and shame on me for not adding on the slide, um, but is data science. Um, that to me is, is probably one of our biggest advantages is that we actually have a data science team now. And uh, I recently made it a goal in this coming year for us, and our fiscal year starts in July, um, is that every AM project we do, cold spray, metal, AM, every, a, every AM project we do will be a data project. And it's not, and, and what I mean by that is it's going to be not just we collect that data and we put it in a knowledge, knowledge management database, we collect that data in a very deliberate way and we feed it into our data science team and they make it fungible, they make it usable, and we turn it into a machine learning capability, an AI capability, so we will have that database uh, across the board on a lot of things, but also too we're going to use that database to then develop more capabilities and learn so that we don't have to repeat the same projects or similar projects over and over again. Um, yeah, obviously the advantages are obvious. You know, Dan talked about there at Norfolk Naval Shipyard, you know, every time you do that repair it gets faster, it gets better. And that's the idea, what we're trying to do here, but do it on a, a much larger scale. So really good to see that. The other thing is you see 160 plus staff. I'm one of the few people without a PhD. I'm one of the few people out of those 160 that's not an engineer. Um, so the expertise and the experience is, is eye-watering. Um, so that's another great advantage that we have at EWI. It is a very engineer, PhD-focused company, but very, very much applied, very much applied research. Uh, we have two locations, uh, many of you may know. Um, I'm out of the headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. That's where the vast majority of the capabilities you see there are, except additive manufacturing. We have our laser powder bed fusion team in Columbus, but the rest of the AM capability really is up in Buffalo, which is our other location, and that's a state-of-the-art facility. Um, and that's where we're gonna be putting our cold spray capability, is up in Buffalo. We have a lot of space up there, um, and, and it's in part because there's a lot of interest in redeveloping Buffalo. And that has been an advantage for us in the WI, and it's going to continue to be an advantage for us. Um, many of you are tracking the Innovation and Competition Act. I think a lot of us are looking to see how are we going to leverage that act to advance the technology, to get the capabilities. Um, and EWI, we are ideally located to do that for two reasons. There's a program called Buffalo Billions, which you can Google. Um, it's where the state of New York is pouring a lot of money into, um, into that area, and EWI has been a beneficiary. Um, in fact, I, this cold spray initiative is, is going to be a big part of that. Uh, the other part is, uh, again, I mentioned the Innovation and Competition Act. Uh, Senator Schumer has really been leading that act. He recently was in Buffalo and met with Henry uh, Cialone, our CAO. So we are very um, tied at the hip with uh, Senator Schumer and the delegation from there. So looking forward to continuing to, you know, leverage that relationship to bring in the technology and the funding we need to support you all and again, develop this Cold Spray Center of Excellence. Really, again, that's our, our main priority right now for investment. So one final thing, EWI, if you're wondering, like you've never heard of us, you may have heard of us. We used to be the Edison Welding Institute, but as that was about 50 years ago when we started out uh, with the engineering department, the welding engineering department at Ohio State, we're still located on the campus, our Columbus offices, 
Um, but we've kind, of, we've kind of separated from Ohio State over time, and again, we've evolved, hence the change of names from Edison Welding Institute to EWI. So. All right. I'm not sure if I'm not pointing this the right way. Oh, there we go. Okay. So already kind of talked about this. This is one of the best things that I, another great thing I love, I should say, about EWI is we have all of these complementary technologies. So as you all know, uh, in manufacturing, and I, you know, uh, talking yesterday with Tom a bit uh, out in Puget Sound, out, of, out there, he, you know, this is, a, this is one technology, it's one tool, right? And these are all the other tools that go along with it. Um, and again, that's the beauty of EWI. All of that engineering expertise and all of those tools we have um, under two roofs but in one house, essentially. Um, so if there's another requirement that just beyond just spraying, say, a material onto another material, you want to do some evaluation of that, or you want to do that in an automated way, um, that is something that we can do. We have the team. We can bring all of that together. Um, I really like what Tim was, was showing yesterday with the advanced automation of using cold spray on robots at sea. I think you know, that's something too that we want to do. We really want to look at how can we automate the capabilities that we have um, with cold spray. You know, what can we do to get that consistency that comes from automation? And the other big part of that, I will say is, and, and, and a lot of us have seen it, is that workforce challenge. You know, automation isn't really just for the sake of automation um, or saving money. It may be the case that, you know, we use automation to augment the existing workforce we have because it's very hard to find those uh, trade skills, those technicians out there that we need, those machinists, those welders, et cetera. So if we can automate what we do, that allows us to leverage the, the, the people that we have, even with a reduced workforce or um, reduced people in the skilled trade. So again, I think that's a big part of what we're looking at. And, and thankfully, our automation team is also located in Buffalo, uh, and we've already been talking with them about how can we, we can work together on this Cold Spray Center of Excellence. So. So what are we looking at doing? It's really, you know, this is our strategy. It's a range of capabilities. So you see a few different systems here. You see the brands. You know the brands, right? Um, you know, we had it. We had a, We couldn't get every system. I would have loved to buy every system out there, but we really had to focus on what we saw as the range of capabilities across the cold spray community and focus on those systems that we thought would provide you all in the CSAC community and, and the wider uh, community with any variety of options, right? And so that's really what we're looking at here. Um, I don't really need to go into a lot of detail about each of these systems, and we do, we do have a, a slides on each of them and what we're thinking, but again, this is just really to show the breadth of capability that we're gonna have. Um, the ultimate goal, though, I think for, for me and I think for EWI is we wanna eventually get to building our own cold spray system. So on our laser powder bed fusion team, we actually have an open architecture system that we built from the ground up. And the beauty of that is, as, as you can imagine, is we can do whatever we want with that. We don't have to hack into uh, an OEM system, nor would we want to, really, to be honest with you, nor would the OEMs. Um, so, you know, we built our own system uh, on laser powder bed fusion just, to, just for, again, being able to add different sensors, try different things, you know, to the benefit of many of our OEMs. Like, hey, we want to try this, but we don't want to take the risk. Well, that's all right. We've got our own system. We'll do it, right? Same, same idea here. We want to build our own system so that we can work with the OEMs and, and work with others to say, hey, comparatively, you know, this is what you should think about. Or, you know, maybe this is an improvement you can do on your own. Or, again, working back with the OEMs, talk to the OEMs about what can we do uh, to help you make your machines better. So that's the eventual goal. That's a reach goal. It's a bit of a moonshot. Um, we're not there yet. But, again, that would be the, again, something that I'd like to see three to five years from now as, as we develop this capability and this expertise. I think if you look at the list of, of really what we're looking at um, in our strategy, you know, I already mentioned the automation. I already mentioned the data science. Um, we want to do a lot of, of IRDs up front as well. Um, so you'll see, so we can learn some of these other things like the velocity, the particle temperature, particle size measurement. Uh, many of you are out there doing that. Many of you already know this, but we want to combine all of that together in one place and put all that data together in, in, in you know, one report, if you will, or, or uh, one repository. Um, but ultimately, those three bullets really build into that last bullet, which is we want to get to a point where 
you know, cold spray is accepted in aerospace. Cold spray is accepted in the Department of Defense. Cold spray is an accepted way across the board to do repairs, to do parts, and, and that people will believe in it, right? And so we want to work with everyone here in this community to get it there. That's our goal. That's our strategy. And, and you know, this is kind of the path we see to get there. Um, you know, ultimately, this Cold Spray Center of Excellence is for you all. We want this to be whatever you want it to be. So, I, you know, I'll have plenty of time, hopefully, here in breaks and afterwards to sit down and talk with you. If there's something you want to do that maybe you don't want to do in-house or is a little risky, then bring it to us. We want to do it, right? So we want this to be very functional. Uh, we want it to evolve. You know, we have a vision now. but We understand that's going to change, and we're going to be flexible, and we're going to be willing to do that and work with you to, to get there. So. Go through the animations here, sorry. All right, so really, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. The experts are out here in the crowd. You know, we got Bruce Coulter here if you want to talk about the Speed 3D system. Um, but again, two quick things. Obviously, we're going to be looking at using it to make parts. And how can we make better parts? How can we qualify the parts that come off of it? You know, when you heard Callum yesterday, he's talking about just good enough. And I totally get that. That's the Marine mentality. Get, let's get it through so we can get through the convoy, the next flight, whatever. But you know, that's not really the end game, you know, and that's not where we're, we're not going to be satisfied at EWI. We want to help Speed 3D, we want to help you all, we want to help the customers get to a point where we can have qualified parts coming off of a Speed 3D system. Um, so really that's kind of going to be our, our goal there with the, the capability we're bringing in. Um, and field deploy is big to us too. Even though we're going to be in a fixed facility in Buffalo, we understand that a lot of the customers, particularly in the DOD or in the, in the defense departments around the world, want to take a capability forward. They want to put it on a ship. Um, we can't assume logistics in the future. Um, and that's, you know, it's not something we talk about much, and I won't say much here. Again, happy to talk offline. But when I put on my military hat, you know, and we think about the future of, of, of warfare, you know, it's been that we've had the luxury for the last 40 or 50 years of just assuming logistics. You know, we just know that eventually we can bring in commercial airliners into Camp Bastion, or, or Camp Leatherneck in the middle of Afghanistan, right? That's just, that's easy. Or we can bring ships into any port we want in the world and offload massive amounts of gear. Um, quite frankly, I, I don't think most people in the Department of Defense think that's going to be possible in the future. So when you start thinking about how do you mitigate the risk, how do you support those, those uh, forces forward, additive manufacturing has become a very viable real option. I think that's why you've seen it advance so quickly. And that's not lost on us at EWI. So again, that field deployable capability, how can you, how can you do this consistently uh, in, a, in a way in the field as well? So it's easy enough, it's not easy to qualify a part, as a lot of you will know, when you're doing it in a lab or doing it in a fixed facility in the United States, it's even harder to do it forward. But again, that's something we want to work on. So I mentioned the Raptor system here. We're actually probably going to go with a Gen 3, uh, maybe a Gen 3 and a Raptor. So I know the, the folks over at VRC would be happy about that. <laughs> but uh, we may go with both in, in, in the case of uh, the center. It just kind of depends a little bit on funding right now. But uh, again, um, really excited about the deployable capability that VRC brings to the table. Um, but also, again, looking at integrating robotics, doing very large things, um, looking at helium recovery, again, fine-tuning a lot of things that are out there. Not, not making the machine, right, but make, helping to make it better. So looking forward to potentially working with Siemens as well. So again, a lot of this stuff is still in the works, but I do believe most of it will come to fruition. So, and we'll probably see it in the next year or two. You know, one of the other things I, I really like about the Raptor system and talking to Glenn down at Tinker, you know, he's really worried in repairs about the heat-affected zone. Um, and that is something that, again, we're really going to focus on is, is how do you minimize or completely eliminate that. Another one of um, our potential customers we're talking to is, is worried about dilution at the surface, right? Again, something we think that particularly VRC system, uh, we, can, we can address a lot of those challenges. Um, and that's one of the th those are the things we're really looking forward to uh, developing and, and, and working with many of you here in the crowd to do. So again, that's what I think we're going to uh, you know, focus on with the VRC system at first. All right, and then finally, a centerline system. Um, again, trying to have the full range. You notice the FANUC there. Uh, looking at how can we, you know, automate that as well. And, and really, you know, we want to make cold spray accessible to the masses, if you will. 
You know, we know um, not every shop can afford a 500,000 or a million dollar machine. You know, not everybody's Norfolk Naval Shipyard, right? Um, and even for those guys, it's hard, right? I mean, being on the DOD side, it's, all, it's not an easy sell sometimes to buy a, you know, a high-end system, particularly right now because we don't have a program of record. Uh, and for those of you who don't understand that, um, what that means is, in, in uh, layman's terms, is that all the folks out doing AM out in the DOD have to find the money every year to do it. It's not programmed. It's not, we have 10 million next year for cold spray and then 15 next year for cold spray and then that most programs of record, you, you know five years out how much money you're getting, you've already said what you're buying and you're moving forward. It's not that way right now in the DOD for, for AM uh, with the exception of a couple small programs of record in the Marine Corps. So, so really looking at how can we make you know, AM, or I'm sorry, cold spray more accessible um, across the spectrum of cost. So, and how can we help the, you know, at the low end, really make that reliable, repeatable, and, and do call cert for certain items on there. Again, you're gonna be limited in your capabilities, but you know, if we can, if we can uh, maximize that for the lowest cost, that's what we wanna do. So that's what we're looking at with the, with the center line system. All right. So I've already talked about this, you know, the complementary technologies that we have. Um, I mentioned we have the full range of AM, metal and polymer. We have you know, all seven types. If you accept that there are seven types of AM, we have all seven uh, in-house. So you know, how can we combine those uh, capabilities with cold spray? We can do some novel things, um, potentially, you know, looking at combining techniques. Danielle and I were talking about an interesting idea, which I know she's going to develop here in the next year or two, and hopefully take all the credit for. So, um, and I'm fine with that, right? We're EWI, we're good with that. So, um, but looking at different types of technologies, how can we combine those? How can we leverage all of what you see here? So, and I think that's nice, because there's a lot of you that can do a couple of these things, or one or two of these things, but maybe not all of them. And maybe that's where we partner too. So that's another thing that we're looking at. We're not looking at necessarily having everything in house. You know, what can we do? Maybe you have a machine that you want us to try out or learn more about, and it may not be any of the machines we have, and we're happy to partner on that as well. Um, or, you know, you have some capability, we have some capability, maybe it's not on there, maybe it's something we don't have, and you're like, hey, we can help you with this, and we want to help you with this when you're doing cold spray. So we're open to that. Um, you know, please, again, reach out to me on the side if that's something you're interested in, but definitely wanted to emphasize this because, you know, this saves time as well. So if we're doing a project, we can get it done a lot quicker in many cases because we're not outsourcing everything to someone else and waiting on a, a subcontractor to do it. We can do it ourselves. So again, focus areas, you know, a lot of you all know this. This is kind of preaching to the choir when you talk at a cold spray conference about what are you trying to do? What are you focusing on? All of this has been talked about and will be talked about over the next couple days. Um, but I just put it up there to, to, to emphasize, you know, that these are the areas we're really going to focus on and look at. And, and, you know, for folks who are not so familiar with cold spray, um, again, what can you do with cold spray? Um, that kind of sums it up right there. And ultimately, it's really just about solving problems. What can, how can we use cold spray to solve problems? Who are we potentially talking to, uh, already talking to, or, or again, soon to be talking to? Just a few folks. There's, there's other commercial organizations. Again, that goes back to the privacy I talked about. We really can't say a lot about who those folks are. But there actually are a lot of, there's actually a lot of commercial interest. I know we've been talking a lot about, you know, DOD and government and military because that's where the funding is for cold spray right now. But we really do see it expanding beyond the list you see there. Um, into the commercial sector. But this is something, if you study, uh, you know, acquisition history, which is really boring, and I apologize if, you, if you've had to go through that, but if you look at it back in the 1970s, um, when we were in the Cold War with the Soviets, um, the DOD was actually ahead in a lot of technology, right? So there was a conscious effort at the time to push technology into the commercial sector to help the con commercial sector be more competitive. Um, since the 70s, that's reversed in most cases. But in this case, I think with cold spray, what you're seeing is we're kind of in that 70s mode where the DOD uh, and the government is going to have to develop the capability, prove it out, and then the commercial sector will adopt it. And so um, we're kind of in that phase, so I think we're going to be a little heavy on, on government, as you can see up there at first. But again, we're starting to get a lot of commercial interest as well as we've been talking about developing the center of excellence. 
And again, I think that's our goal is to help eventually move it out into the commercial sector and reinvigorate the industrial base, reinvigorate you know, production in the United States or repair in the United States so that, again, we don't have to be so dependent um, on our allies, our partners, or potentially even our adversaries. You know, I think COVID exposed that a lot. I don't, it's, again, preaching to the choir, I think you all saw it. We all understood what happened during COVID with PPE, but it was a lot more than that. We're still experiencing a lot of those challenges right now uh, for parts, uh, especially subcomponents. And, and now I think, again, it makes cold spray more viable because maybe instead of replacing the component, we, can, we need to repair it. Again, some great examples from Norfolk Naval Shipyard where, yeah, you can replace the component, that's great, but you can wait a year too, right? And maybe cold spray costs more, but, does it, but if you factor in the time, it actually probably makes more sense. So again, I think the time is right for that. I think even on the commercial side, they're starting to see that. So hopefully, we'll be able to help uh, drive that forward at EWI on the commercial sector as well. And at the end of the day, it's all about the people, right? It's not about the people, it's all about the people. So what are we looking at bringing in? You know, our goal would be to bring in a dedicated, you know, research scientist with a lot of years of experience. Uh, again, missing the bullet here, I should have on here, we also want to bring in, you know, a dedicated engineer that we can have full time, a young engineer that, that can be with us for a long time and help really develop the capability. And we're looking for someone who's passionate, who believes in the technology, who, as I used the term last night, is a zealot for additive manufacturing, like many of us are in the room, like I am. Um, and, and again, is all about moving the ball forward for cold spray. So, you know, a dedicated research scientist, uh, you know, a young up and coming engineer, and then a technician, right? And so that's a, you know, manpower is a challenge. Um, you know, people are challenged right now, we, we get that, and, and, and really one of the big challenges for us is trying to get those folks to move to Buffalo. So, uh, but I think, uh, you know, bet be between the local talent we have there and some, again, folks who are just passionate about technology and don't care where they live, um, I think we have a lot to offer. Uh, and, you know, a little plug for Buffalo, and I'm not getting paid by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it actually is kind of a cool town three months of the year. So, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so it's getting better. So, and you've got Niagara Falls. You've always got Niagara Falls. So, anyways, but um, you know the other great thing about EWI, and I mentioned it earlier, is you've got a team of PhDs and engineers, just in the AM department, with over 50 years of additive experience and much more experience writ large. And the other thing I want, that's not on the slide is when I first pitched this idea at EWI, I expected a lot of resistance from a lot of the other teams and a lot of the other engineers. Actually, what I got was a lot of enthusiasm. So even in those other joining and forming and welding to, uh, areas of expertise, everybody saw cold spray as important and as a big deal and as something that we needed to add to our portfolio. So there is a lot of support within EWI, within the other functional areas to make uh, this successful. So, and that's, that's really encouraging to me and I think that's, uh, again, a big advantage we have at EWI and I'm looking forward to leveraging that. So with that, I think I actually kept it close to 20 minutes, which is, uh, you know, pretty incredible for me because, as some people will tell you, it takes me 20 minutes to sell a simple story. So, uh, go ahead and open it up to questions now. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, okay. Okay, so the question was, how are you going to work with uh, your partners in the DOD, particularly the Air Force, to help develop qualification standards? I think that, okay. Yeah, so one of the big things we're going to look at is, and, you know, already been talking to some folks, is, you know, what's your problem? You know, I mentioned heat-affected zone, right? I know that's a challenge for Glenn and the team down in Tinker. So, you know, what, what can we do to minimize that and still provide a product that can be employed, qualified, certified, and be done consistently. So I mentioned IRDs, uh, internal research and development. Um, again, that's something that even before we stand up uh, the, the capabilities, which we're looking to do really have a lot of this starting in the fall, is partner with some of those folks like VRC potentially um, to do some of that IRD work and say, okay, we're gonna, let's, let's look at this one problem and let's try to solve this one problem. Right, so heat effect of zone might be one, right? And then if we can do that, you know, up front, again, that's something that we can give 
back to the Air Force or the DOD, and then that can lead to more, right? I, th I think that the key is, though, looking at a single problem, not trying to, you know, as we say in Marine Corps a lot, boil the ocean, right? Let's look at one or two things that we know are out there, and let's focus our first research on that, and then we'll evolve and, and go from there, if that makes sense. All right. All right. Thanks, Aaron.